morning. Good morning. Oh, that was weak. Good morning. Good morning. And hello way out there. <laughs> I think you're, I don't know if you're afraid the speakers are going to bite or what. I don't know. <laughs> but it is good to see each of you this morning. Uh, it has been two months since we've been able to uh, be together, to join together like this. And so, uh, welcome. Uh, I hope you have prepared yourself for worship. Um, oftentimes, we we know that uh, the musicians have to prepare. We expect the pastor to prepare. We expect these all these various people to prepare. But y'all, this is all about all of us praising God. So I hope that you have prepared yourself for worship this morning by praying, by sending yourself upon God. So as we gather in this place, we we can give God a true sacrifice of praise. I also hope that you've come with great expectations. It's been two months, y'all, and there was a video, I believe it was uh, Michael Hoggard shared of uh, the preacher on the first Sunday back, and it was him going in, and uh, I think he ended up, like, body slamming somebody, so look out is all I can say. Um, but no, I hope you've come with great expectations for what God's going to do this morning, and I know that God can exceed those. Uh, in the way of a few announcements, um, I want to thank all of those who made this part possible. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts and pieces, um, everything from our deacons uh, serving as ushers uh, to uh, I want to thank Jacob for making the sound possible. And, um, and then each one of these people up here with me this morning uh, in helping us get set up and, and everything. I, I'm, I just want to thank them and, and thank you all for being here. Uh, for having a desire to worship God with us this morning. Um, as you arrived today, hopefully uh, you uh, went by and there were there's a note. There were two notebooks, one that said praise items and one that said prayer requests. Um, I hope that you went by and if you had any of those, filled those in in the notebook. And in just a little while, I might see if somebody can bring those up here to me when we get to that portion of our service, so that so that we can do that. Um, It'll be easier to do that than trying to get everybody to kind of yell their praise item or yell their prayer request up here. So just if you if you haven't done that and would like to, run back there and, and write down your prayer request or write down your praise item, and I'll share it this morning uh, during our worship service. Also, if you need to use the restroom, obviously the Fellowship Hall restrooms are open. And if you do happen to get too hot, we have a cooler with some water in it over here. Uh, so uh, feel free if you get a little too warm, step over there and get some water. Um, as you leave this morning, uh, we will have an offer plate in the back. Uh, so uh, please, as you leave, if you want to go by there and um, leave your tithes and offerings there as you leave this morning. And I uh, do want to encourage you to do your best to social distance. I know that uh, we haven't seen each other in a while. And of course, the first thing you want to do when you haven't seen somebody in a while is give them a handshake or give them a hug or whatever. Um, but let's try to respect our space in that way. And... Um, and I know that 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 the God will bless us in the fellowship, regardless. Um, at the conclusion of the service, I'm hoping I, I'm hoping the temperature stays low, and I'm not sweating bullets whenever we're finished. But I'm either going to step into the fellowship hall or towards the rear end of the parking lot here, because uh, I do want to see everybody. If I go in the fellowship hall, it's because I am burning up, y'all. Uh, so uh, you can step in there, or um, you can head on, and uh, we will go. For uh, just in regards to the rest of this week, tonight we will have Facebook Live worship at 6 o'clock, so just keep that in mind. Uh, I hope that uh, most of you have been able, to, uh, been able to worship with us in that way. Uh, Wednesday night we will have our Zoom Bible study, and then be paying attention for any announcements about uh, next week. Um, I know that, there, that uh, one of the federal judges here in North Carolina has uh, um, put a temporary restraining order on... Um, uh, kind of the governor's executive orders, so uh, we may be making some adjust adjustments next week, so just be, be paying attention uh, to the phone trees and to Facebook, and we'll put out any announcements about exactly what's going on. All right, so with all that done, let's shift our minds to worshiping our great God this morning, and let's begin this by going to God in prayer and asking God's blessings upon our time together. So let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you that you are God. 
And we thank you that you have given us the privilege to gather in this place and to worship you wherever we are at. For those of us that are gathered here at the church, for those of us that are at home, God, wherever we are at, that's our sanctuary. That is our place where you are dwelling, and that is the place where we are going to worship you now. I pray that you would would honor this time together. May our words of worship be true. May everything that we say truly reflect what we believe about our great God. May our songs be pleasing to you, God. May our actions point to you. May our thoughts recognize who God is and lead us to celebrate our great God. God, be pleased to dwell with your people at this time, wherever we are today. We give you ourselves. We give you this service, and we give you this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. And amen. So you will find the lyrics to all the songs in your bulletin this morning. So I hope that you will uh, join us in singing. I want to ask if you will to stand. And our first song is a song that... If you, if you ever wanted God to come and make himself known to you then in this service, if you, wanted, if, you, if you want God to come and make himself known to you in this service, say amen. amen. If you want God to come and change your heart, your mind, and your life this morning, then say amen. If you want God to challenge you this morning, then say amen. If you want God to encourage you and equip you this morning, then say amen. That's what this song is about this morning, asking God, the fount of every blessing, to come and fill our hearts. I'm my one, three, 
Lord our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies. You have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foes and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That's the God that we worship. That's the God that we pray to. And so at this time, we are going to get ready to go to God in prayer. And I will share with you the items of praise. Uh, let's see, uh, Joe and Joan Wynn uh, are doing much better after surgeries and uh, other old people problems. Now, that's, not my, that's not my words, that's someone else's, okay? Um, uh, Mr. Phil is uh, five weeks since his accident, and he is doing much better, and thanks for the prayers. Uh, let's see, uh, Stephanie Cobb. Uh, Uncle Joe's granddaughter had had a baby, and it's Harper Caroline. So uh, praising God for that. Also just praising God for the opportunity to gather here and worship, and praising God for those clouds right there. And um, it is just just the little things, just to praise God for, the, uh, for life, for providing his son, Jesus Christ. Now, that's not a little thing. That was a big thing. But Jesus Christ to save us of our sins. And, and y'all, we have so much to be thankful for. Uh, oftentimes our, our prayer requests are much longer than our praise items. But let's not forget that our the things we have to thank God for way outnumber the things that we have to ask God. Um, as we do go, and we do have our items of concern, um, Jane Harrell has uh, cracked bones in her wrist, so uh, praying for her. Uh, prayer for Curtis Bailey, he's with his dad today. Uh, Donnie Whitehurst with bladder cancer. Uh, Tammy Riffle, uh, tumor on the brain, had surgery and is doing well. Uh, Nick Cannon, uh, Steve Lazarchak. All right, hey, I did it all right. Um, uh, his wife is a former co-worker and friend of uh, Miss Karen's, and uh, we definitely need to uh, need to keep him and his uh, family uh, in our, or that family in our prayers. Um, are there any any? I I know I said that, but I just want to say, uh, if you ha how about this? If you have a prayer request, just raise your hand. Just you know, we all do. I'm not gonna call, I'm not gonna call you out, but just we all have prayer requests. We all have things that we know. That, uh, that we need God to move in. And so uh, let's, you know what, I'm going to ask Timmy, if you will, to lead us the Lord in prayer this morning. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come before you today humbled once again. We thank you for bringing us together and giving us this beautiful day, Lord. Lord, we're so thankful to have so many in attendance, Lord. And we, we're thankful to have those that can that can watch us via social media, Lord. Lord, we thank you for all the praise items we have today, Lord. And it is it is great to be out in your creation, Lord, to see it today. <clears throat> Lord, it is pure evidence that you exist. Lord, we thank you for all the all the items that have been mentioned, all the people that have been mentioned, Lord. <clears throat> we ask that you be with the caregivers of those, Lord. Be with the family members. Lord, come surround them with your love, Lord. Let, let them know that you're there for them, Lord. And we ask all of these things in the loving, <clears throat> the love of your Son, Jesus Christ. It's his name. Amen. Amen. 
This next song is one that just, it's a song about what Christ has done. You know, as, as we're gathered in this place, coming to this place, and we, we come here in the name of Jesus Christ. And he came to this earth as that, as that little baby boy, humbly submitted to the cross, was buried in a tomb, three days later rose from the grave. And he ascended to the Father, and he is coming back. And so as the chorus of this song says, Oh, praise the name of our Lord, our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, our God. I'll ask you if you'll stand, please.
handle it. But I want us to sing that fourth verse again, where it says, He shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. shall return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 4. Now I'm going to try my best to confine myself to this microphone, but I make no guarantees. And so if I move, I'm going to pray to God that he provides some miraculous way of amplification. But... um. When I read, that's where I'll be reading from is Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And so I want to begin by making a statement. There's good, and then there's something better. Most everyone here knows that I'm a, that I'm a self-proclaimed meditarian. I get my vegetables secondhand. I let the cows, the pigs, the chickens, I let them eat the vegetables. I eat them, and therefore I get my veggies. Sounds like a really good plan to me. And, and so in that vein, my favorite meal is a steak. I love a good steak meal. And as a young adult, my favorite place to go eat was Outback. And so I knew exactly what I was going when they gave me the, the, when they gave me the menu. I typically just open up the menu to go find exactly what it was so I could say it just right the way it was in the menu. I was going to get a sirloin steak, a baked potato with, with butter, cheese, and bacon. Once again, leave out any vegetable that you could possibly find. And, and that was what I was going to get. I was going to get it cooked medium. That was my favorite meal. And, and it, was, it was and still is good to me. But something changed. You see, um, I met a lovely young lady named Elizabeth. And I got to know her family really well. And, and her daddy told me of a place on North Carolina 301, just on the, I guess you'd say the west side of Wilson, uh, that was entitled The Beef Master. Now, I had never been to The Beef Master, but beef and master sounds really good together. And so we went, and, and, he, and he had spent all kinds of time building this place up. And so every time he'd talk about it, my mouth would water. And so we got there, and I was looking for the menu because I was going to point to my sirloin steak that I got at Outback. Well, they didn't have that. What I found was they didn't have something good. They had something better. 
they had ribeye, which I had never had ribeye before, and it was wonderful. <laughs> and I had that, and I will tell you, everything Mr. Bill said about that steak was just right. And so you see, my favorite sirloin steak cooked just right was good, but that was even better. And I'm sure we can all think of moments where we thought we knew we had what we, what we had was good, where we thought that everything was just fine. But in fact, we found something better. Then maybe it might be something silly like a steak or it might be something even, even grander. See, this is what we see in our text this morning. Hebrews is pointing out that the people have experienced something good. The people of Israel had experienced something good. They had experienced God's movement on their behalf. They had experienced the, everything that God had done for them in the past and the ways that God had moved through them, moved through the nation of Israel. But God was now doing something better through Christ. And so let's read our text this morning and see what's being said. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. It says, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. May God add his blessings to the reading and the hearing of his holy word, and let's go to our great God in prayer. Almighty God, we gather during this time, along with millions of other Christians gathered around the world to praise the name of Jesus Christ, to praise you through song, to praise you through actions, and to praise you by hearing your word proclaimed, God. I pray that you would be with all of our brothers and sisters, wherever they are, God, that, that they would experience you, God that they would be worshiping you, that they would be opening, them, opening themselves up to be changed by the word, to encounter the word. I pray for those that are hearing this message at this time, God. God, that you would help them to open their eyes and ears and hearts and minds. And God, through your Holy Spirit, help these words find a place in the lives of the people that are listening, God. And may it cause changes in those lives. I pray for myself, God, I pray that you would help me to humble myself, to empty me of me and fill me with you, God, so that what I say and what I think and the things that I do, God, are what you want me to do and point to everyone to you. Hide me behind the cross, God, because the cross is what we should all be focusing on this morning. God, we love you and we praise you and we ask this in all prayers in the name of Jesus Christ. And amen. So our text this morning is the prologue or the introduction to the book of Hebrews. It lays out the entire purpose of this book. And so if you want to know what the author of Hebrews is aiming to say, look no farther than these four verses because these four verses set the tone for the entire book. And so as we begin on our journey through Hebrews, let's kind of set the table per se. If we're getting ready to dine on this amazing spiritual meal, let's kind of make sure that we understand what's on the table. So, to be perfectly honest with you, it's one of those few books of the Bible we don't know much about. And for instance, if you were to go and look for who wrote it, the answer in every commentary is going to be, I don't know. There are various educated guesses people that you've heard in scripture, Apollos, if you've ever read the, the, the letter of Paul to the, the, the first letter of Paul to the church at Corinth, he mentions Apollos. Well, some believe Apollos, some believe Barnabas or Luke or Silas, and even Paul has been mentioned as a possible author. And so we really don't know who wrote the book. 
Well then, to whom was it written? Well, that's another one of those. If you read most commentaries, they're going to tell you we're not 100% sure. Nowhere in the letter does it say specifically who. Were they in Rome? Were they in Jerusalem? Were they in some other city? Were they Jews? Were they Gentiles? Were they a mixture of the two? We simply can't answer that question as easily as we can with other books of the Bible. And then another one of those questions that will oftentimes go to the text to try to help us understand the text is when was it written? Well, the best they can do is guess a 40-year range. So that's, that's like saying I was born somewhere between 1950 and 2000. Now that's kind of what, what's happening here. The, you know, they, have a, they have an estimate. And, and for most, most of the time when we're, when we're studying a book of the Bible, these are very important. And really help us understand what the author is trying to say. So without these clues, without knowing who the author was and when it was written and, the, and who the, the audience is, we're simply presented with the text itself and the references that it makes to the Old Testament. And these, 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 this entire book is very unique including some of the specific things that, that Hebrews does. It, it's included in the New Testament uh, with, uh, with the epistles, with the letters, but this is not a letter. If you start reading it, if you start to look at it, this is more like a sermon. If you start to read the book of Hebrews, he jumps right into it, presents this amazing thought at the beginning, and then just dives deeper and deeper into these various things. So what, and so this is, just to kind of let you know, just kind of lay this all on top, instead of talking about the writer or the author, you're probably going to hear me say the preacher of Hebrews. And I will tell you, this man preaches better than Billy Graham. What, what he says here is powerful. And so what can we tell for certain? What are the things we know for certain from this text? We know a few things about the writer or the preacher. All evidence points to him being very well educated. He knew Judaism. He knew Christianity. He knew Greek. This man was smart. Don't tell me God doesn't know what he's doing. Whenever he has people like like cho choosing the preacher of Hebrews, he knew exactly what he was doing. He's part of this Christian community and is writing to a group of believers that he knows. And so this whole text is is he's trying to get them to understand something. So what exactly is he addressing here? Why is he preaching? Why is he writing this sermon out? I'll tell you, as I began to look, I began to see something that was rather familiar, that we see pop up in church all the time. His congregation was tired. Raise your hand if you've ever been tired before. I'm sure most of us in here could raise both hands and both feet. Now, think about this. If you, as you read the, the book of Hebrews, you're going to see that this isn't necessarily just a physical exhaustion. They are, they are tired of sacrificially serving the world. They are tired of worship where they are continuously giving God the glory in their individual lives as a church. And really, they don't see the benefit of it. They're tired of being peculiar people. They're tired of sticking out in the Roman Empire. They're tired of the persecution. They're tired of the struggle. They're tired of trying to keep their prayer life going. They're tired of trying to keep their devotional life going. They are tired. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you felt that kind of tired before. The chances are you have. And if you haven't, you're going to. Because the Christian life is not easy. See, Hebrews paints an image of people with their hands drooped and their knees weak. He says in Hebrews 10.25, the attendance at their church was down. They were losing confidence. And so the threats to this congregation was not that they would run off in the wrong direction, but that they would run off in no direction at all. That they, that they were going to just say, I give up. And some of them are even considering leaving the Christian community and falling away from the faith and going to Judaism, which would have been much easier, 
And for many of them, they knew, really, they knew very well. And we recognize this very same problem in our churches. We get tired. We get tired of pressing on. We hear about our triumphant king who loves us. We hear that one day he is going to return. And we sit there and go, when, Lord? We, we, we can identify with John when he says, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. God, come. And while we're waiting, we get so tired. And we begin to ask all questions. We may, we may be even may even begin to say, is it worth it? Do I really need to bother with this whole church thing? Do I really need to bother with this whole Christianity thing? This world seems pretty good right now. And this is the situation into which the preacher speaks this morning. To the original congregation, Judaism was good. Christ is better. And to those of this world, to you and I, the world may look good. The world may even look easier at times. But Jesus Christ is better. Let's look at our text, and I think you'll see what I mean. As he, as right here at the beginning, he begins to develop this idea. Here at the very beginning, he, there's this marked contrast that he makes. Where, where we see... Uh, the difference in the revelation of God before and the way that God revealed himself in Jesus Christ. Now remember, he's writing to these people who are trying to decide, am I going to stick with this Christianity thing? Am I going to stick with Christ? Or am I going to fall back on Judaism? Because in the Roman Empire, Judaism was okay. Christianity was not. And so they're trying to figure out, are they going to go with something safe or are they going to go with Christ? And so he begins by saying, in the past, God revealed himself at many different times and in many different ways. Now think about the Old Testament for a second. Think about the ways that God revealed himself. Through a voice speaking to various patriarchs. Through visions. Through dreams. Think about how God initially got Moses' attention. Y'all know, to that, burn, that, that non-consumed burning bush. Or a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Tell me that wouldn't get your attention. Tell me if it got really, really hot and all of a sudden God just provided a cloud that just covered this parking lot. You wouldn't go, hey, what's up? <laughs> or if you were really, really cold and all of a sudden this pillar of fire appeared right there and you said, hey, thank you. You know, that would get your attention. Or think about whenever, whenever Moses ascended up on the top of Mount Sinai and the scripture gives us this image of a cloud descending upon the mountain and completely consuming the top of that mountain and hearing what sounded like a thunderstorm occurring. Tell me that wouldn't get your attention. And then God speaking in a still, small voice to somebody like Samuel who was sleeping in the temple. You see... God spoke in many ways, and he, and he also spoke through the law. He spoke through the Psalms. He spoke through the prophets. God revealed himself in some amazing ways to the people of Israel. These were powerful. These were effective, and they were very familiar. And the people had grown accustomed to those being the ways that God would speak. That God would speak through the law, that he would speak through the prophets, that he might would send down a messenger every now and then, that he might would send a thunderstorm or a rain cloud or whatever to get their attention. But verse 2 continues the sentence. Of, verse 2 is part of the same sentence of verse 1. So those two connect. And it's connected with one of those, uh, if you're an English teacher in here, maybe you can, maybe you're sitting, you can say, and I'm using the word right, but I believe it's called a, a conjunction. There's a three-letter word there. It says, but. Now, that word, I, I, there was a, uh, one of our other Free Will Baptist ministers, uh, he preached a sermon called The Blessed But. And he was talking about that Jesus Christ was dead. They had went to the tomb and, and you know, they were expecting to see something. They were expecting to see a dead body of Jesus Christ. But then it says in Scripture, the angel said, but he is not here. Well, we have that same thing here in the book of Hebrews. It says, in various ways and in many times, God spoke through the prophets, but 
See, it interrupts the prior thought. It insinuates that something is getting ready to challenge what we think we know. Something new is about to emerge that will rival the old. A fresh form of God's speech had come. A better revelation of God. And this, ups, this sets up the entire theme of the book of Hebrews from this point forward. That if what God did through the prophets was good, what Jesus Christ did through Jesus, or what God did through Jesus Christ was better. He was a better revelation. We know, we know him. We have all, we have all that we need to be saved through him. And have a perfect relationship with God through him. Look at the remaining portions, the second half of verse 2 all the way through verse 4. What most scholars believe is that this was an early hymn of the church. We get, I guess you could say we're cracking open the hymn book of the church that the preacher was a part of. So let me read the words of this part to you. The second half of verse 2 through verse 4. So if you have it, you can follow along. Jesus is whom he appointed the heir of all things through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. In these verses, we see an amazing and a powerful statement about Jesus. All kinds of statements. Just look at some of the things it says. He is the heir of all things. As the Son of God, he is the appointed heir of all of creation. All things belong to him. Every sunrise, every sunset, every bird, every tree, every animal, you and me, belong to him. He rules over it all. He is God. All things were created by Christ and all things are sustained by Christ. You see, if you, if you start to think about this, and it'll start to make your head swim, but the scripture kind of handles this a little bit. We know from Genesis 1-1, the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth. And so John pulls all this together in John 1, verses 1 through 3. Listen to what it says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was, Jesus was, with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything that was made. John taps into the idea that God created the world and then shows us how God and the Father are the same. That they were pre both present in creation. Jesus was and is the word of God. He was a walking, talking Bible. Jesus was God himself. When God created, it was Jesus creating. How, how all that works together, it's a mystery of the Godhead. But what we know is Jesus Christ and God the Father are one in the same. And other places in Scripture teach us that not only does not only was Jesus part of creation, but the creation itself is held together by the Word. Creation itself is sustained by Jesus Christ. And if you are a child of God, then your spiritual walk is sustained by Jesus. Not by anything that you have done, not by anything that you could say, not by anything that you could think. Your life, your spiritual walk is sustained by God and God alone. And that's one thing, that's one thing we can tap into by looking at this passage of scripture, understanding that all of creation is sustained by God, including us. In verse 3, Jesus, it says that Jesus is the very radiance of or the reflection of God's glory. It says that he is the exact imprint, the perfect representation of God. This is where, this is where the preacher in Hebrews is starting, to, is starting to really pour it on. Because he said, y'all, you haven't seen anything. If, you're, if all of your revelation about God is from the Old Testament, well, then you are missing something. Because Jesus 
is better. Jesus is the exact representation of God. If you want to see God, look at Jesus. If you want to know how much God loves you, look at what Jesus did. If you want to know the power of God, look at the power of Jesus. If you want to know the authority of God, look at the authority of Jesus. If you want to know God, get to know my Jesus. Because Jesus is better. We also see that the preacher concludes his opening here by saying that Jesus is higher than the angels. You see, there had been some people, and there's even some people today that have views of maybe that Jesus was a man and, and God kind of adopted Jesus later on in his life and, and made him the Messiah. And there were people in, in, in the early church that were trying to figure out, they were trying to make this whole Jesus and God thing work. And so they were making Jesus like an angel. And in fact, the, the, many of the Jews would have put Jesus just a little below the angel, some of the early Jewish Christians. And so right here at the very top, he is saying, uh-uh, ain't nobody greater than Jesus. And I will tell you one thing that is so, so true. If you know Jesus, then you know there is nothing greater than Jesus. Before time and now, Jesus is much superior to all the angels. Jesus is God and he reigns as God. Throughout the book of Hebrews, the preacher expounds on these ideas. The main point is to highlight the fact that Jesus is is better. Y'all, if you don't hear anything else I have said this morning, if somebody asks you what your preacher talked about, if you can't say Jesus is better, you weren't listening. Because Jesus is better than the past. He's, he's better than the current trials we are facing. He's better than religious or philosophical alternatives that the world may present. Simply put, Jesus is better. And we'll ask our, our worship leaders if they'll come and get ready to, to help lead us in our last song. This morning, I've shared with you how Jesus is better. You may be able to identify with the people that we see here in this sermon originally being preached. You're simply spiritually exhausted. You're tired. You're tired of church. You're tired of church people. You're tired of trying to live right and to do right. You're tired of seeing evil people prosper while you struggle. You're tired of being peculiar. You're tired of sticking out. You're tired of people saying, look at that Christian over there. You're tired and you're wondering what the next step is. Do I stay faithful? Do I see what else is out there? Do I step away altogether? Well, I tell you the same thing that the preacher said. Nothing in this world compares to Jesus. Jesus is better. Perhaps you've never truly known this Jesus that we're talking about, so you don't know if he's better or not. Your life may be good, but I can promise you it'll be better with Jesus. So if you do not know this Jesus I'm talking about, then during this time of response, I pray that you will, that you will repent of your sins, that you will say, God, I am sorry. I know, I think I've got it right, but, but there's got to be something better. I know there's something more. I see my sins. I see what you did on the cross. Jesus, you truly are better. I hope that if that's you this morning, that you will spend this time responding to God by surrendering it all. Our song of response this morning is going to be How Great Thou Art.
sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. I pray, God, that that will be our song. The song of our heart, the song of our mind, the song of our soul as we leave this place today. You're more than good. You are great. And we praise you, God. We praise you for all that you have done. We praise you for the cross. We thank you for willingly spreading your arms wide on Calvary Street and providing for the forgiveness of our sins. You paid our debt. You faced the wrath of God on our behalf. And God, we thank you for that. Oh God, we thank you that it does not end there, but you rose from the grave three days later. How great you are. And God, the world may offer so many things. The world may try to get us to take our minds off of you by offering all kinds of philosophies, by offering all kinds of religions, by offering all kinds of, quote, alternatives. But God, you are better because you are great. May we remember that at all times. Whenever Satan tries to get our minds on other things, on our problems, on other people, may we remember that you are God and that our minds, that our eyes and our hearts should be always set upon you. God, 
might be with us as we leave this place this morning. And wherever we are at, may we live a life that brings glory and honor to the name of Jesus Christ. Because he is great and he is better. God, we love you. We praise you. Now, God, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And all of God's children said, Amen.